uh, I spent way too much of my career going out to the site and saying to the contractor, I told you I just needed a photograph. I didn't need to come out here. Or alternatively, going up to the site and said, saying, I told you I wanted to come back. You're going to have to tear that wall down because I have to see what's going on behind it. Episode 126. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Welcome back, Architect Nation. Have a great, great interview ahead of you. are going to want to stick around for this one. We're going to dive into some of the more technical aspects of architecture. One of my favorites, kind of get down and dirty with building details and all sorts of fun stuff. Before we jump into that, however, I wanted to remind you that we're about a month away now from the Business of Architecture Summit happening on October 29th and 30th. And I just want to remind you that you only have about a month left to grab those tickets. It is an online event. It is a virtual event. We're going to have some amazing speakers. We have some speakers lined up. We're going to be talking about strategy. We're going to be discussing marketing, business development. Uh, We have one of our speakers is going to be talking about how to make a project plan. So you can make sure that your project fees line up with what you're actually making and increasing your profitability. So to get that, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash summit. Today's guest is one of the world's foremost authorities on construction quality. And he actually currently is the director of quality at LeadCore based out of Vancouver, Canada, with 14 offices in Northern America. He's also the author of An Architect's Guide to Construction, Tales from the Trenches. This is book one. So I want to welcome Brian Palmquist to the show today. Brian, welcome to Business of Architecture. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. Brian, I'm holding your book here, and this is quite a fun read, Uh, very different from a lot of the other business books that I often read. But this is truly only an architect or a contractor or someone of that ilk would really enjoy this book because it is... I mean, there's, you have some wonderful anecdotes in here about construction mistakes and how to handle contracts and everything. So I'm a big fan. What, what inspired you to come out with this book? I can tell a lot of work went into this. Well, um, I've been an architect for more than 35 years. I won't get too specific there. Um, and I've been teaching younger architects and intern architects for 18 of the last 24 years about construction administration. Um, I decided it was time to pull it together into a book format. Um, I also, when I go to conferences, I've been seeing increasingly that especially younger architects are frustrated about lack of mentoring, about, you know, how do they get that practical day-to-day stuff, um, you know, from us guys with grayer hair who, you know, are, are, are so busy trying to make money for everybody that we don't have time to train anybody in how we do it. So it was a, a combination of those things. Absolutely. And so tell me a little bit about the format of the book, how you have it laid out here. Okay. Um, Well, interestingly, um, it was originally a a more conventional book. It had 20 some chapters in it. And um, my wife, who's my best critic and editor, um, didn't want anything to do with it till it was like done. And then she looked at it and she said, not going to work, Brian, because (laughs) uh, 25 page chapters are just too big. So um, so I recast it as 70 short tales. Now, a couple of them are longer. You can't talk about uh, how to do um, uh, a change order in one page. Uh, but a lot of the material was susceptible to a tighter frame. And so what I did was I took the basically the, the whole construction phase from, um, you know, the bidding phase through to post-construction warranty, whatever, and laid out a series of tales in approximate workflow order. Uh, and each one starts with a, a quote, which are, are 
mainly true quotes, but I've changed the names to protect the innocent and guilty. And then there's a, a you know a brief introduction, like what's the point of this tale? Some of the details, and then I dive into here are practical ways to manage this piece. Excellent. I mean, there's everything in here from, I mean, I love some of the stuff about change orders or, you know, you know, the, the contractor wants to propose an equal, hey, this, you know, we can't get this material on, on site in time. So we're going to put this in <laughs> all sorts of good stuff in here. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And, and you know, the, the, the getting it on time one was funny because one of the tales in there is about somebody pulling that one on me and, and, and I, couldn't figure out why the proposed substitute, which was was so much cheaper than the original uh, proposal. So I went home and I and I put the name of the proposed product in and I added the word litigation. <laughs> and class action websites jumped up. So I just took the, the 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 URLs of the of the sites and I forwarded them to the rest of the team and and said, "Are you sure?" That was my subject line. That was it. <laughs> so that was a lucky one. But uh, but yeah, you, you learn these things. You know, it's if your gut tells you that it doesn't make sense, probably you're right. You just have to figure out why that is. Brian, how, how common is it to have an architect in a position like you have being a director of quality at um, basically a construction firm? Um, it's not that, that common. Um, the... I kind of meandered into quality because um, I used to be, I used to do a lot of building envelope work and building code work. And um, uh, I helped a lot of people fix leaky buildings over the years. And then there were so many leaky buildings that insurers decided that they were going to uninsure every architect and engineer in, in my home province. So I panicked and, uh, and basically said to my insurer, how do I avoid this? And he said, we well, need a better quality management system. So I developed that and, uh, and then, um, and it worked very well for me. And then I was using it with another engineering firm and along came Lightcore Construction with a huge project where they needed a quality management program. And they, um, they kind of identified that it was me and my program that was the quality management piece in this engineering company. So they did that cool thing. Instead of hiring the company, they hired me. <laughs> And I've been there ever since. So that that's kind of it's a you know quality and architecture are intimately related. And but architects and engineers seem to assume that if they just do what they do, that it's automatically quality and quality managed, and it's not that easy. So that's how I got there. Now let's talk about drawings about best practices. How does a, what's a framework for creating a great set of drawings? Because I'm sure, as from the contractor side, you've looked over many many different architecture firms drawings yeah um i think the absolute cr main criterion is well there's two things one properly coordinated uh, i see many many sets of drawings where they just kind of fall apart um, and they fall apart within themselves in other words the details that the architect has drawn are not related to the pictures of elevations and plans that have been drawn and they don't coordinate with the various engineering works. That's probably the biggest, um, the biggest challenge. And the other thing is that architects, when they draw buildings, um, they have passionate parts. So let's say you're doing a, let's say you're doing a big box retail store and most of it's pretty ho-hum and such is the nature of the beast, but you've done a really nice thing at the entry to the store, something that's unique, memorable, and you know, you think should win some awards. Contractor doesn't know that. So you if, if you draw it with no detail, if you draw a pretty picture that can't be built, it's not going to happen. So, so you have to coordinate your stuff, and then you have to uh, spend extra effort on the things that are really important to you. And then when you start construction, you have to say to the, the builder, by the way, that entry port cochere, that's, that's got to be perfect. And I'll do anything I need to do with you to make it perfect. So that's, that's to me, that's the thing. Identify what's important to you. Make sure you focus on it. Make sure you communicate that focus and make sure that everything is, is as well coordinated as you can manage. Do you have any tips or suggestions for coordinating drawings, making sure they are well coordinated? How does that get done? Well, 
I'm sort of old school. I, I, I'm used to looking at everyone's drawings um, as they evolve every week, identifying where they don't uh, mesh, making notes, communicating that, having meetings, making sure those things are happening. Uh, that should still happen. Uh, unfortunately, the use of, uh, of uh, CAD and BIM, things like that, have sometimes caused people to figure that that's magically happening through somebody else. And in fact, sometimes it does. The construction company I work with has a separate BIM department. And, uh, and we will, for a fee, do your clash detection for you. Uh, and where we're, um, where we are brought in as the construction managers or pre-construction managers, that becomes part of our service. But really, that ought to be something that the consultants do, in my opinion. So however you do it, you just, it's, there's no magic to coordination. You just got to do it. Uh, in, a, in a big picture sense, you, you mentioned BIM. Over the years, have you seen drawings get, have drawings been getting better in terms of the coordination? Have they been getting worse? Or are they just kind of the same? They always were since you started in your career? Um, I would say that they, they have been getting worse and they may be soon getting better. Um, uh, BIM was seen as a savior of all of us. And like anything else, it takes work to make it do that. And until recently, it's been such a huge learning curve to, to master it that many architects have either not, and, and engineers and contractors have either not done it or just skimmed the surface. As with any technology, it's becoming easier to do. So we are seeing an improvement in the um, in the drawings that come with a sort of a BIM tag on them. And in what ways are you seeing BIM being utilized now? Is, how is LEDCore using it? How are you seeing other people using it? How is the adoption coming along there in terms of BIM? Adoption is coming along really well. Um, we, I mean, the, the classic thing that consultants and clients assume that contractors do with BIM is what we affectionately call clash detection. You know, here's where the light runs into the duct, runs into the column. Uh, and we do a lot of that. Um, but uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, our architectural brethren um, love to do complex things. We, we just finished an office tower in Vancouver, um, which uh, twists in, in three dimension as it goes up over 35 floors. And... Um, Nobody could figure out the amount, it's all curtain wall. No one could figure out the square footage of the curtain wall from the pretty picture drawings. So we created a BIM model and, and we had a, a huge budget that the curtain wall uh, sub had given us. It was a construction management thing. Part of our job and that is to help the owner get the best value for the money. And we, we the budget for curtain wall felt wrong. So um, for a very modest amount of money, we, we modeled just the exterior facade and uh, we're able to calculate the exact uh, air area of glass, the exact linear length of all the mullions, and we're able to convince the owner and the sub and the consultants that that was a good number. So the unit rates were applied against that number and as the building unfolded, it was it was fine. And the the number we came up with was about $2 million less than the subcontractor's initial guesstimate had been. So uh, that's the kind of thing we use it for often. We also use it in what we call 4D BIM, where we can actually take it with our schedules and identify how a building is going to be built. You know, what happens first, where we have to jump, what, you know, what happens next along the way. And that's a very powerful tool, both for the sales end and for the construction end, because you know, if you want to do something different, how does that affect the three-dimensional overtime construction of the building? Mm. That's typically what we're doing with it. It's a lot of fun. So it sounds like it. Brian, in your in your job position right now, what is your what do your day-to-day -day duties entail? I'm trying to get a picture for what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Are you out in the field? Are you are you internal reviewing quality control measures? What does your day look like? Um, well, it, 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 it varies. I get out in the field whenever I can. That's where I, I, I learn most. Um, uh, essentially, I, I'm, we, we have, uh, at any given moment in time, we'll have a hundred, uh, 
projects that are part of our quality program. We're, at any given moment, we're building about 250 projects, but 150 of those are really small. And they're part of our program, but I don't monitor them. So uh, I, through 14 quality managers, I'm typically monitoring uh, the quality aspects of 100 projects at a time spread around North America. So that's a fairly full-time thing. And of course, uh, it's it's somewhat by exception. So in any you got 100 projects going, there are always issues. So you try and stick your oar in and help where you can um, and help, you know, it, it, after a while, you just get to know, I, I had a, a circumstance the other day where we're taking over a project uh, in, in one of our Eastern offices from a another contractor. And the quality manager there started to describe what we were getting into. And it sounded exactly like a project that we had done two years ago in Hawaii. So I put the Hawaii team in, in contact with the Toronto team so that we could you know, lesson learned, like instant uh, uh, stuff. So it's a lot of stuff like that, figuring out what's going on and helping people, you know, do it better. And so a lot of these issues, are they coordinated via, okay, here, guys in the field, they're going to send you some pictures, they're going to send you some documents, and you're going to figure out where you're at, or are you actually flying out there, going on site and looking at these things? Uh, it's increasingly uh, digital and remote. Um, there, there's too many sites, too many places. The quality managers in the 14 branches um, get out in the field more because they're there, um, although some of our branches are pretty geographically spread out. Um, and, you know, the, so the digital world helps a lot. Um, one of the challenges in, in our business, though, is that um, unlike consulting, uh, construction, the big difference between construction and any of the design professions is that um, you're not real till you're on site. So uh, a good, a well-coordinated group of consultants will meet periodically during the design phase, do coordination, assign stuff, send stuff all over the place, you know, do all that kind of stuff largely digitally with periodic face-to-face -face meetings. Um, when you get that into the construction phase, um, it's much more difficult to do that remotely. You know, the, the, and, and for the folks in the field, if you just call them up or send them emails and say, do this, do that, there's a problem here, whatever, you're not going to make any progress. You show up, you spend a couple of days sort of walking in their shoes, and that's when you learn things and make progress. Um, I, 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 uh, one of my colleagues here, uh, when I was working on a really big project uh, and just started on it, he said, Brian, you want to find out what's going on? make the effort to come to the 6.30 a.m. superintendent's meetings, and that's where you're going to find out what's going on. So I made that effort. It was hard sometimes. And, uh, and, and sure enough, um, you know, there's all sorts of other meetings going on and coordinating this and doing that, whatever. But the real boots on the ground, what on earth are we going to do today? How are we going to do it? Stuff uh, happens that way. And if you're there and you're participating, um, you'll learn a lot more and you'll be able to help a lot more too. What are some of the top mistakes that you're seeing or quality control issues, shall we say, if you had to list five of them, the architect should be looking um, out for? Uh, curtain wall is a big issue because so much of it now is um, made abroad. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But uh, one of the things I talk about in, in the book is um, uh, what I call critical new and foreign product. So if a team has never used a product or the product comes from uh, a different place than the place of the work, like substantially different, like a different continent or whatever, you can't treat it the way you would uh, if it came from the lumber yard 10 miles away. And, uh, and because um, we were good at and used to doing that until recently, both designers and builders have, have been hoodwinked by um, by issues that arise from different standards in different places. So we have a, a, a critical new and foreign product procedure, which is not really magic. It's a number of steps, but it, it, that helps a lot. Um, and that applies to curtain wall and sometimes to steel. Um, we, we, uh, interestingly, the green building movement uh, we, uh, one of my colleagues is, is a leading expert in, in, 
green buildings because she was tasked with how do we build these things when we first started to do them? We, we, we've become quite expert at it. But one of the challenges we have is, for example, um, the increasing incidence of fly ash in concrete um, affects uh, the setting up of concrete, affects mixed design. And we, um, we find frequently that uh, in a place where uh, we've done a lot of work, but we haven't previously done green, green building work, uh, a long-standing concrete supplier will uh, have a lot of challenges at the beginning getting those mixes right. So it's the basic stuff, curtain wall, concrete and steel. Um, uh, wood frame, the challenge there is always just um, making sure there are enough details that it's not going to leak because uh, if it leaks, it rots. So, And in terms of if we if we look at the curtain wall, what kind of issues are you seeing with curtain walls? Well, we've had everything from um, <clears throat> the failure of, of the seals between the, the, the panes of glass, which is a bit serious when you've got a 60 story building full of it. Um, and frequently the, um, the fabrication process uh, is happening far enough away that, that you get a, a complete unit. Now, when we used to get a complete unit, we would assume, um, we would make assumptions about how well it was put together. Can't necessarily do that because sometimes the folks who are putting it together, um, our, met, our type of construction curtain wall is new to them. It, it, it might as well be bread and butter. It might as well be brick or whatever. So it's a foreign material to them. Therefore, they don't have it in their bones how to do this. So what we have to do for that is um, we hire more experts. Uh, all of our curtain wall buildings usually have a curtain wall consultant who's expert in that. We do more testing and sometimes the testing is done at the place of, of fabrication uh, on another continent. Um, and we have, to, uh, we have to make sure that our checking procedures and such are rigorous enough that at the end of the project, the design consultants will sign off the, the building as being, you know, properly built. Do you have any examples of sort of the, the best stories that you'd like to tell about, you know, lessons learned from uh, lack of quality control or things that went awry? So you just said negative at the beginning and positive uh, uh, before that. So you want me to tell good stories about bad stuff <laughs> or good stories about good stuff? Let's, let's, hear, let's hear stuff we can learn from. So, for instance, um, you know, you've, you've seen a lot. Of, your, your book is full of these, of these anecdotes and stories, um, you know, primarily about, about things that looks like they happened because uh, procedure wasn't followed, uh, checklist was not in place. Uh, maybe documentation wasn't there. So I would just love to just kind of keep it informal here a little bit and talk about some of these stories that maybe we can learn from. Sure. sure. Um, well, okay. In, in terms of, of things that have a, a positive outcome that anybody can do, um, <clears throat> I used to, when I was a building envelope consultant, uh, I used to have a lot of trouble with submittals because somehow what was sent to the office wasn't what appeared on the construction site. And the, and this is when I was a consultant. So the contractors were just as upset on the site because I would come out and say, no, that's not what was approved um, in the office. So, so we developed a, um, a, a, a submittal review sticker, um, entire submittal review, all the, the legalese and stuff was on a sticker about that big, just an Ames mailing sticker. And um, uh, the contractor would line up like eight or 10 things in a construction shack. I would go out, I would look at them. If they were the right thing, I would uh, mark the item as reviewed, sign the sticker, put it on the item and take a photograph of it. And that photograph was the record. And the, and the, the contractor just loved it because he could immediately turn around call up his supplier, whatever, and say, okay, we can order 100 of these or 50 of these or whatever. So um, so that's an example, I think, where the, the frustration of office versus site and uh, 
the lack of coordination, if you will, on the contractor side, you can help that. And, and you make, you make a friend because when you, all the contractor wants to know is, is it okay to proceed? And what, and what, if anything, have I done wrong today? So, uh, a second positive uh, piece, if you will, is, um, uh, actual submittal review going back to that. Um, and especially substitution, um, my standard submittal form that I use uh, as a consultant um, always has a piece for alternatives and substitutions. So for, let's say, uh, a window, um, the specifications um, that I hopefully I wrote um, will say, I want to see a sample. I want to see shop drawings. I want to see manufacturer's literature relating to the product and to, and I want to see a copy of the warranty. Um, historically, then the contractor will say, okay, I got a better product. I got, some, you know, you're going to love this. And so what you get is you get an email on a Friday afternoon saying, Hey, you're going to love this other product I want to use. Um, and it's going to save the owner money too. And it's this, this thing. And what do you say? And historically the architect then turns around and does all sorts of homework on the contractor's behalf to determine whether or not uh, it's an appropriate substitution and doesn't get paid a dime for it. So it, so I got tired of doing that. So, so in my uh, submittal form, if you make that call to me, then I will send you my submittal form and say, okay, what I want you to do now is to, fit, is to look at the specs and the drawings. And in the left-hand column, fill in the stuff that I wanted you to use. I want the data, you know, give it, it, the manufacturer's literature, test results, uh, standards that applicable. And then I want you to take your product and give me the same information in the right-hand column and then give me that package. Um, and so sometimes the contractor will back away and say, oh, I don't want to do that. So fair enough. I didn't have to do a whole bunch of work. If the contractor does uh, give me that information, if it looks really close, then I'll do some research because it really is a substitution. Often it's really a change to design. It's really a different enough piece that all pretty well all architect client agreements say that submittal is part of your job. Change of design is an additional fee. So if you have a piece of paper from the contractor that clearly says, um, you know, this is what you expect and this is what I'm going to give you. Um, then you can take that same thing. Don't do any work. Take it to the owner and say, happy to help, but this is a change to design. So my fee to, to review this change to design and coordinate it is going to be whatever it is. Um, cause sometimes contractors will go to clients and say, I can save you 500 bucks if you let me do this. And they haven't factored in the fact that it's going to take $1,200 worth of architect time to review that and make it work. So if the savings is $10,000, then spending $1,200 of my time, giving me more money to do the job may be worthwhile. I'm, I'm setting aside all of the, the aesthetics here. I'm just looking at the, the hard stuff, if you will. Um, but if it's marginal, then the client will say to the contractor, just, just, just do what he wrote, please. You know? um, so, so that's, I don't know if that's positive enough for you. It's kind of ways to make our life uh, easier. Um, the other one is uh, field review is a, is a, a real challenge um, for everybody. Uh, I, I like to say that there are two parts to any field review and architects don't understand one and builders don't understand the other. So once you get past the weather report, um, you know, it's this date and I'm on the site and it's raining or snowing or whatever, then um, owner, the client architect agreements and our professional responsibility require us to make observations about the progress of the work. And so we say things like uh, windows are proceeding on the west elevation, the workmanship seems generally uh, uh, in accordance with the design documents, and that's covering our butts. You know, that's saying we went there, we looked at it, it looks okay. Contractor could care less about that. What the contractor wants to know is, are there any problems today? And so, so the contractor doesn't understand that observation piece and it gets in his way and annoys him. 
the builder doesn't, sorry, the consultant doesn't understand that the builder just wants to know what the problem is. So, so my standard, uh, uh, field review form has, um, uh, two columns. Um, is it an observation or is it a deficiency? So and you just tick one or the other. And so if you're the contractor, you can just run your eye down. Oh, deficiency. Okay. You know, oh, observation, forget it, whatever. Um, and, uh, and the other thing is on the right hand side of that thing, it, it says, and this is something that the consultant identifies. How do you want Mr. Consultant, how do you want me to provide you with evidence of having completed this? So if you really trust me, maybe an initial from me, the contractor saying I've done it is okay. Or do you want me to take a photograph and send it to you? Or do I have to call you back? Cause I don't know about you, but uh, I spent way too much of my career going out to the site and saying to the contractor, I told you I just needed a photograph. I didn't need to come out here. Or alternatively, going up to the site and said, saying, I told you I wanted to come back. You're going to have to tear that wall down because I have to see what's going on behind it. So the point is to help each other understand each other, clearly identify what is an observation, what's a deficiency, and how if it's a deficiency, how do you want to manage the proof that you've done it? Great. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.